Zach and Bill. Um, and then we're also going to have a Q&A portion of the discussion after that. And if you want to submit questions at any time for the Q&A, um, you can use the chat box functionality and you can either direct those directly to Zach or Bill or Troy, um, or you can send them to Dan Bear and I'll sift through those and pass one along to Zach. Um, and so to enable the chat box function, just take your mouse and put it in the bottom middle part of your screen and there'll be a cloud bubble that'll pop up. And then if you click on the cloud, it'll enable the chat box and then you can use that to send us questions. All right, let me know if you have any questions through the chat box. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. This is Jim. And uh, if you're on this call, you've probably been involved in one or more of WGA Chairman's initiatives. And I want to thank you uh, for your participation in what's been a very successful part of the overall policy work effort at WGA. Uh, chairman of this organization have the prerogative to commit a substantial amount of resources and, and uh, uh, um, uh, staff time to a particular initiative or project or issue of particular interest. Uh, I would hasten to add that this generation of governors have, have taken on issues that are really big and sprawling and complicated. And we recognized early on that, that it would be difficult to get anything meaningful done within the course of the one year of a chairman's service as chair. Uh, so for example, um, we are now really in the fourth year of what started out as Governor Meade of Wyoming's initiative on species conservation and the Endangered Species Act. We are in the third year of the effort start initiated by uh, uh, Governor Bullock of Montana, the Western Governor's National Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative. Uh, we are well into the first year of, of Governor Ige's initiative the Biosecurity and Invasive Species um, in, Initiative. Um, the model that you may be familiar with has involved or does involve uh, um, workshops across the West, webinars, targeted outreach, the assembly of broad stakeholder groups, uh, engagement of federal jurisdictional agencies, and it has been uh, tremendously successful. It's a model that has produced uh, actionable policy recommendations. Uh, you will note that the, the debate on uh, the Endangered Species Act that is raging on Capitol Hill and the administration uh, is very much um, uh, connected to the recommendations that the governors produced on ESA on a bipartisan basis. Uh, the limitation to this model should be fairly clear. If we do a new initiative every year and we assemble a new stakeholder group just around that initiative and nothing ever goes away, pretty soon we are uh, spread uh, pretty thin. And the other point that I would um, acknowledge is that you know, we recognize that these issues are, especially in the resource world, are incredibly interrelated. So invasive species affect forest fire, which affects habitat, which affects endangered species, which affects land use, and on and on. So pulling together all of these considerations, we want to create a place where initiatives after their first year of, um, uh, after their first year as a chairman's initiative can go to live and cross-pollinate and to thrive. And, and would like to be in a position to leverage a larger group of experts to examine these cross-cutting issues um, um, that impact these different uh, kind of granular resource issues. So, so we took this idea out for a test drive in March, on March 15th, the Ides of March, when we hosted the Western Working Lands Forum uh, in Denver. Uh, that's really kind of, that was a predicate discussion for today and the rollout of the Western, uh, or the WGA Working Lands Roundtable. And uh, to discuss uh, that in greater detail, I'd like to recognize uh, Zach Bodane, a, a policy advisor at WGA who, who's been running uh, the uh, endangered species work and who is helping uh, to coordinate uh, the roundtable. So, Zach, take it away. Great. Thank you, Jim. And hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining. Uh, we really appreciate your engagement in, in this effort and look forward to continuing to work with you moving forward. 
Um, Jim articulated well the need for the Working Lands Roundtable that we're here to discuss, um, but I'd like to expand upon a few of the points that he brought up. Uh, this effort will really serve as the consolidating body for all natural resource-based WGA chair initiatives following their initial year of information gathering. Uh, that stands true for past, present, and future initiatives. Uh, so what does that actually mean in terms of functionality and process? Um, I, I, before I answer that, I'd like to provide a little bit more context um, and, some, and some background on previous WGA chair initiatives. In the past few years, WGA chairman's initiatives have traditionally consisted of an initial year of scoping and information gathering. This included hosting a series of workshops, webinars, uh, and employing other tools for outreach across the West to bring together regional subject matter experts in a discussion uh, of a relatively narrowly defined topic. Uh, examples of this have included initiatives on drought, species conservation, and the Endangered Species Act, forest and rangeland management, and now invasive species and biosecurity. One of the strengths of this WGA chairman initiative model has been the ability to continue developing and refining discrete policy recommendations based on the findings of that first year scoping effort. Uh, an, an excellent example of this uh, recently has been the Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act initiative that Jim referenced. The process to develop policy recommendations in the out years of that initiative involved in-depth working sessions which provided the opportunity for WGA to lead a detailed and extremely granular examination of the issues presented during that initial year of the initiative. This approach has proven worthwhile and has demonstrated success in developing substantive and meaningful bipartisan policy on difficult and at times contentious issues. Um, now, through this new Working Lands Roundtable model, we do not intend to steer clear of these deep dives on issues of critical importance to Western governors. We recognize that chair initiative issues are selected initially because they have unique aspects requiring close individual consideration. However, we also recognize that their impacts on the working landscapes of the West are intertwined. In response to this reality, we're proposing to approach specific issues and their impacts through a more holistic lens while still maintaining a focus on those specific issues when it is appropriate. This holistic and cross-cutting approach to policy development and issue identification uh, is certainly in keeping with our core mission here at WGA to serve Western governors and the region as a whole. Governors do not have the luxury of being able to consider issues in a vacuum, so we took it upon ourselves to think bigger as well. Not only is it siloed consideration of issues and threats to Western lands unrealistic from the perspective of a governor, it also ignores the reality of challenges facing Western land managers, policymakers, and landowners, and limits our ability to develop innovative interdisciplinary solutions to complex problems. Every land or resource management decision must be made in the context of its broader impact on the landscape. Federal land management policy has profound impacts on private and state land. The inverse is true as well. We should be looking at cross-boundary responses to these challenges and working in collaboration to address threats to the viability of the Western working landscape. This recognition led us to develop the WGA Working Lands Roundtable uh, as the vehicle through which we will advance policy discussions that reflect the interrelated nature of wildfire, species conservation, invasive species management across jurisdictional boundaries and professional disciplines. So that's, that's some background on, on how we developed this. How will this actually work in, in implementation? Uh, some of you on the webinar attended a meeting that we hosted in March that Jim referenced on cross-boundary conservation efforts and collaboration in working lands management. We really viewed that March meeting as somewhat of a pilot project for this model. We invited ex experts in forestry, rangeland management, wildlife conservation, invasive species management, uh, and water resource management to that meeting. And we hoped uh, from gathering all those folks to build a blueprint for what this model could look like uh, with that diverse group in the room. What we heard at that meeting was a resounding emphasis that governors should continue working in this space and should continue to pull together interrelated pieces for a collective and more integrated discussion for the region. Uh, we are following up that meeting that we had in March uh, with this formal announcement of the Working Lands Roundtable and also we'll be hosting a follow-up to that meeting uh, coming up pretty soon here on October 11th and 12th in Cheyenne, Wyoming that will focus on land restoration and invasive species management. 
So whereas the March meeting looked more at proactive and collaborative approaches to land use planning and management, this meeting in October will look at the other side of that equation and look at when planning is interrupted by a disaster or unforeseen threat. We want to consider how we can build out a collaborative and adaptive restoration response to disaster while also taking into account the threat that invasive species pose to the working landscape of the West. Uh, beyond this next meeting coming up in October, we anticipate hosting another Working Lands Roundtable meeting in the spring of 2019 that will continue to build on both the, the March and October meetings that I've referenced. So outside of these uh, specific roundtable meetings that we will continue to host uh, beyond this October meeting and March meeting uh, in the future, uh, we'll also be hosting webinars that will dive deeper into specific issues raised through past WGA work uh, or, or can broadcast specific findings and discussions from these in-person roundtable meetings to a broader audience. Um, beyond webinars, we'll also be rolling out a page on the WGA website that will serve as uh, the, the clearinghouse for all things Working Lands Roundtable. Uh, we'll archive all of the meetings and work products that come as a result of this effort uh, and be sure to keep folks looped in there. So I'm happy to answer any more specific questions on either this roundtable effort uh, generally or specific questions on the October meeting coming up and, and how that folds into this effort. Um, but I think before we get to the question and answer portion of this webinar, I would like to kick things over to uh, my colleague Troy Timmons, who is the WGA Director of Strategic Initiatives. Um, thanks, Zach. Uh, I won't take a lot of time here. You and, and Jim have done a great job of discussing the challenges WGA faces in operationalizing our governor's initiative um, and the strong potential of the roundtable to address those and, and some of our other needs. Um, I had the privilege of managing uh, WGA's National Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative. Um, like our other WGA initiatives, this was a really uh, strongly bipartisan and, and really productive effort. The initiative resulted in almost 50 recommendations by the governors. Um, it's been rewarding to see that several of the legislative recommendations have already been enacted into law. Um, many of the administrative recommendations are currently being implemented by our states and, and federal agencies. The challenge we face is keeping attention on the implementation of those recommendations. Um, in, in trying to figure out how to do that, I, the roundtable should be a pretty efficient way for WGA to do this over the long term, um, providing a platform to examine how states and agencies are doing. Uh, not only in implementing the recommendations, but examining whether those recommendations are working or whether they need some reevaluation. Um, an added benefit is uh, the ability to tap the expertise and the relationships developed uh, in WGA's other initiatives um, in support of the National Forest and Rangeland Management priorities. Jim did a great job discussing the links between our different initiatives and the importance of being able to bring those efforts together under a single umbrella. Um, the Working Lands Roundtable allows us to formalize this broader cross-cutting, cross-boundary examination that really ought to be a fundamental part of our policy work here at WGA. I'm really excited about the effort, and uh, like Zach, I'm looking forward to answering any questions folks might have about it. Thanks, Zach. Great. Thank you, Troy. Um, so finally, I, I, before we get into the question and answer portion of the webinar, I would like to kick things over now to Bill Whitaker, who is a policy advisor here at WGA and is currently managing Governor Ige's ongoing uh, biosecurity and invasive species initiative. Thank you, Zach. Um, that is correct. I'm the uh, policy advisor at WGA for forest, rangeland, and invasive species management. Um, and that means that um, I am working on a lot of cross-cutting uh, cross 
boundary issues, uh, landscape level issues, and among them is Governor Ige's chair initiative, the Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. We are right in the middle of that. It was launched on a webinar in July of 2018. I encourage you, if you um, need some more information on it, to go revisit that webinar and learn about the, the goals of the initiative. Um, but the overall, the goal is to focus on the impacts that nuisance species, pests, and pathogens have on ecosystems, forest rangelands, and watersheds, and infrastructure in the West, and to examine the role that governors play and state agencies and um, all the stakeholders play in um, uh, using biosecurity to address those risks. Um, we're planning on doing that through a set of workshops in the West um, and the as well as targeted webinars with the goal of developing a set of policy recommendations and best practices and technical tools to address those risks. The first, uh, we just are um, hot off of the first workshop that was in Lake Tahoe, Nevada on September 17th and 18th. Um, really uh, great success, really good conversation. We're pleased to have it. And then um, work, uh, looking forward to October 11th and 12th, um, and that is the, the Working Lands Roundtable. We're integrating a lot of the work that we do um, with the initiative into that event. Um, following that is Helena, Montana on November 14th and uh, the, the on the island of Hawaii on December 9th and 10th, um, directly before the WGA winter meeting. Um, those workshops will be followed by a series of targeted webinars starting in about January of 2019, um, or a couple uh, months after that, and uh, that will allow us to have a more focused, deep dive into topics that we didn't address on um, during the workshops. But I'm really excited to be working on this issue, and I'm really excited that this works, that this uh, that biosecurity and invasive species, this initiative is being um, pursued simultaneously with launching the Working Lands Roundtable. I think it's just um, fits completely naturally into it. Invasive species affect nearly every sort of resource management issue in the West. Their impacts are enormous um, and j just massive, almost impossible to quantify. Uh, but even in spite of that sometimes, and this is what I hear talking to invasive species managers in the West a lot, that um, in spite of the impact that a lot of times invasive species managers can kind of feel like they're working in isolation, they're working on their individual species or they're working on their individual type of species or in their area, and that there isn't sometimes enough recognition from the people who are being impacted that invasive species in, in many ways is the driver for, um, or one of the drivers for the increase in growth of wildfire in the West. And it's the impacts that it has on agriculture and, um, and rangelands and rangeland dependent communities and um, the impact that it has on threatened and endangered species. It is about as the most cross-cut cutting issue that you can have and uh, I think uh, the, what we can do, all the work we can do to highlight um, the different impacts it has and the different ways it um, impacts people across borders and the way that we can work across borders to address those issues, I think um, the more effective we'll be. And that is one of the big goals of the initiative and that's one of the big goals of WGA going forward. Out of this, um, out of this work, we're going to um, this initiative will follow a model similar to other initiatives where we uh, work at, where we um, take comments received, input from the workshops and the webinars to write a final year one initiative report with recommendations and best practices and action items going forward. And those action items are going to be implemented by WJ staff and its stakeholders in the context of the Working Lands Roundtable. And uh, that'll um, give us a great opportunity. I hope that a lot of those recommendations do um, cover a breadth, have the sort of cross-boundary um, breadth of uh, address the breadth of issues that invasive species impact. And so I think um, I'm looking forward to the outcome of the report and I'm looking forward to using the roundtable um, every six months to revisit this and to revisit how it impacts WGA's other, the other areas of WGA's work and other resource issues across the West. Thanks for that, Bill. Um, and and this, this is Zach Bodin speaking again. Um, before we jump into question and answer, I'm gonna quickly touch on um, how this, this work under the Working Lands Roundtable pertains specifically to the uh, Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act initiative, which was the chairman's initiative that I managed for Governor Mead um, and continue to manage going on. So I know that uh, many folks in this webinar have been pretty extensively engaged specifically in the Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act initiative. Um, 
how I envision this moving forward is, is that WGA will continue to bring together that coalition of groups that we have assembled through the initiative and that we will continue to host intimate working sessions to refine and advance policy recommendations developed through the initiative. Um, you know, we recognize that there is significant work remaining on specific issues uh, uh, relating to the species conservation and ESA initiative. And we hope that through this roundtable model, we can continue to move the ball on developing recommendations that will advance voluntary species conservation efforts, that will consider how wildlife conservation is funded, and will consider how the act itself could work better. Um, however, all of those points I just touched on will also be considered in light of the broader WGA, WGA effort to build out cross-boundary and cross-cutting policy recommendations through the Working Lands Roundtable. Um, so for instance, just to give an example of how this could be operationalized, um, at the meeting coming up in Cheyenne in October, um, we're hosting a work session uh, that morning on how regulatory assurances can incentivize cross-boundary conservation efforts spanning both private and federal lands. Um, that's not a panel discussion. That's not a, a um, it, it's not a, um, a well, a, it's not a, a formal presentation. It will function basically as a breakout session, a work session that I know a lot of you that participated in the second and third years of the initiative have, have come to recognize and be familiar with. Um, we're hoping to tackle that issue uh, in coordination with the other events going on in October. Um, we'll also be examining through this work session uh, administrative obstacles to promoting voluntary conservation efforts on habitat spanning mixed ownership landscapes. Um, but the advantage of doing it through the roundtable is that not only are we bringing in folks that have been engaged with the Species Conservation and ESA Initiative, we'll hopefully gather um, some folks that are more active in the forest and rangeland management space or, or that have uh, expertise in invasive species management who can also lend some, some, um, some expertise to that discussion. So, through that session, you know, we're really hoping to refine WGA policy recommendations that already exist on species conservation in the ESA that are pertaining to specifically incentives and assurances for private landowners to conserve habitat on federal lands under an agreement like a candidate conservation agreement with assurances. So um, that is, that's just one example of how, how we see this being operated or how I see this being operationalized moving forward under the Working Lands Roundtable. Um, so, I think now, with all of that said, we'd like to open the floor up to uh, question and answer uh, for all attendees. Um, if, if you haven't seen already, Kevin mentioned at the top, there is a chat box that you can open up. Um, you can feel free to send your questions uh, to, to myself or to um, Dan Baer, who's, who's up there on the panelist sheet through that chat box. Um, and, and we will read them out and, and respond. Um, so we have one question that came in. Um, this is from uh, Brent Keith with the Nature Conservancy. Appreciate it, Brent. Um, it's, a, it's a statement and then a question. So it says, thanks to WGA for providing this forum. I think this approach appropriately recognizes the interrelated impacts, uh, the challenges and drivers of change impacting natural resources in the West whether working to better conserve species, take forest management efforts to a larger scale, or manage invasive species, recognizing the interrelated nature and possibility for system scale changes in our behavior and management is important. Um, so the question specifically that Brent asked is, how do you anticipate the round table functioning beyond meetings to drive policy change? Uh, is it through policy statements, through reports, or recommendations? Um, that's, that's a great question. Thanks, Brent. Uh, I think, you know, how we anticipate this roundtable functioning beyond simply hosting meetings um, is trying to, to develop somewhat of an iterative pattern. So I, I, I mentioned in the remarks that we're going from that March meeting, which looked at proactive conservation efforts, planning efforts, uh, to this discussion now we're having in October on restoration that will also loop in with Bill's work on invasive species. Um, I think that we're, that we're hoping that Coming out of this October meeting, we now have a, a field of play that's pretty clearly defined with two meetings under our belt. And, and from there, I think we can work to operationalize um, building out some webinars that can expand on findings 
um, maybe putting together some ad hoc working groups um, of folks that are particularly engaged in a specific issue that really seems to resonate across the, the spectrum of jurisdictions or, or folks that are, that are there. Um, and as needed, try to see how that pertains to existing WGA policy and see where we may be able to uh, either refine that policy or develop new policy um, going forward. So um, that I think, and, and also to, to get to your question on reports, I, I think there will be an element of reporting going on with this, you know, beyond the, the website page that we will be launching that will archive all this information. I think that we'll also be putting out um, uh, an annual report on the activities of the Working Lands Roundtable so that folks can, can kind of keep track of what we're up to and, and see where we're heading on a year-to-year on -year basis. Um, so does anyone else, Troy or Bill, have, have anything you want to add to that? The, I think what you're, and that reporting mechanism hopefully uh, allows us to report out on the different initiatives, but do that in a more integrated fashion than all these separate reports that we currently do so that folks just in one document can see, uh, get a good outline of, of how all these efforts coordinate with each other. So, thanks, Sean. Um, I have another um, question here, and, and it's coming in. The, the question is, um, how will priorities for roundtable meetings and webinars be determined? Um, so how are we going to, to figure out the, the focus of these roundtable meetings going forward? Um, you know, I think kind of as, as I mentioned in my first response to that, to that initial question, um, I think we hope that this develops into somewhat of an iterative process where uh, we, we, we feel that the, the information presented through this roundtable or the information that we're taking in um, is generally leading us in, in a direction that um, is being driven by stakeholders and being driven by governors. Um, so I think in some ways with the, the priorities we hope will become apparent in the, uh, um, through the efforts of the roundtable itself. Um, now, with that said, this, this October meeting that we put forward, we realized that we had some gaps to fill um, based on what we did not get to discuss at the March meeting. So, um, in some ways, it, it, it can also function to help fill in um, information gaps or, or help to bring to light um, an area of focus that, that may not have re received as much attention yet, um, but has been, been deemed um, warranted of consideration by by the folks engaging with the roundtable. Um, Bill or Troy, do you want to add to that? Yeah, and it's, there's plenty of um, opportunity there. If you look at what we've done with um, with under the National Forest and Rangeland Management umbrella, um, it's Somewhat like, for example, some of our follow-up discussion in that, uh, under that rubric, has been on partnering with tribes on uh, land management priorities, um, alternative dispute resolution, and as we've examined some of these other uh, components that we that we didn't during the that initial year of the forest range land management initiative. Um, I think that you'll hopefully see that as our thinking develops on some of those other issues, like the ones I just discussed, we would integrate those into um, that the roundtable series as well. And uh, but the most important aspect of this, obviously, is that. Um, the way we do work here at, at WGA is the governors help us or are the ones that direct uh, our priorities. And and I think as you see uh, the new initiatives come online um, and, and direction from the governors and governor staff, 
that too is going to have a, a very direct influence on uh, the direction that these um, that our roundtable workshops would would go, and hopefully integrate all of that thinking um, and keep, uh, all the while keeping an eye on the governor's priorities. Okay. And then on the uh, in the invasive species front, um, I, I agree with everything that Troy just said, and I think. Um, for example, we've uh, been able to work well with our invasive species advisory group that WGA forms, and I think that's been a very good uh, relationship that we've had there, and that they've, um, it's, a, it's a group of stakeholders that helps provide us uh, WGA with some really technical information that um, we just don't have the capacity um, to, to know on our own. So getting direction from the governors, set, them setting their priorities. If you look at the work that we've done on invasive species data, it's the governor setting their priorities on invasive species and then particularly cross-boundary invasive species data management. And then um, drawing on the expertise and the experience of the uh, technical group to help sort of fill in um, some of the more detail on that and find ways to actually achieve uh, and implement um, some of our, our goals on improving cross-boundary invasive species data management. Um, it's been really successful at this point, and I imagine we'll, we'll keep using that model going forward. Great. Thanks, Bill. I, I think that leads us pretty well into um, another question, which is, um, what will happen to existing WGA policy recommendations um, developed through past initiatives uh, and, and how will those inform ongoing roundtable work? Um, yeah, that's, I, I, I think really we, we have through the, this set of chairman's initiatives on forest and range management, species conservation in the SA, and now biosecurity invasive species, we have a pretty immense amount of, of work and a pretty immense amount of thought that has gone into uh, developing uh, specific, specific policy recommendations adopted by the governors. Um, I think we feel that those recommendations, you know, really serve as the baseline for this effort and, and in, in any way that we can find cross-pollination between those governors' recommendations. Um, in a way that is a little bit more holistic or cross-boundary and find a way to integrate uh, new challenges that are emerging or that are brought to bear through this effort. Um, I, I think that we'll look to do that at every opportunity. You know, I mentioned that we're taking um, a work session or a breakout session at this uh, upcoming meeting in October to specifically try and refine um, a, a WGA recommendation on uh, for a WGA recommendation that resulted from the Species Conservation and ESA initiative, uh, I think we want to look to to use that to not only refine that specific recommendation and and try and um, look towards implementation. You know, we also want to bring in folks that might not have originally been in the room while we were discussing that to begin with. So bring in some of the other expertise. I, I think that's really the value that this model can add in in terms of. Um, it, it, casting a wider net on these, but also um, staying grounded in the fact that we, we have a lot of policy on this already, and that really should inform um, a pretty extensive dialogue going forward on how that policy interacts, uh, I, I think is really what will be driving this. Um, anything else, Troy, to add to that? The other component of that is that this gives us a mechanism to, to reevaluate where we've where we've been, both the policy recommendations, the policy resolution, the actual policy resolutions that guide WGA's work, but also the recommendations of the of the initiatives. Because over time, you're going to see. Uh, well, I'll, I'll use net forest and rangeland management as an example. Over time, you're going to see that those recommendations have either been implemented or are not implementable and that this hopefully the roundtable allows us an opportunity to, to evaluate where we've been and where we should be going and um, that I think is over time should be a really uh, one of the great aspects of the roundtable. Um, allowing us to keep up with where things are rather than just live 
statically in the past. And, and that actually, Troy, brings up something that, that I forgot to mention, um, and, and it goes back to existing WGA policy. Um, you know, I, I, I think we hope that, um, you know, this, this roundtable effort can be ongoing and dynamic and, and um, ever building. Um, but a lot of that comes back to the, the governor's policy that they have adopted here in form of policy resolutions or recommendations. Um, our resolutions, for folks that aren't intimately familiar with our, with our policy process, policy resolutions adopted by the governors have a three-year lifespan. Um, so when our resolution is adopted, we, in three years uh, following that, are, are, are then um, kind of forced to look at the issue again in, in light of new information that we have um, and, and see if we wish to update the policy resolution to see if governors um, have any a, additional changes to the resolution. Um, and I think we hope that this roundtable process um, will help to inform those governors' deliberations on policy resolution and help to, to fill in any gaps we may be missing there. Um, so I just wanted to, to add that last that last bit there. Um, Bill, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I can add from the perspective of a current initiative on um, how we anticipate, because we will be a past initiative at one point, and, uh, and how we plan on incorporating um, those recommendations in there. And I think it's, it's one advantage in having this format um, as you're running a current initiative, because I, I anticipate the recommendations coming out of the Biosecurity and Invasive Species Initiative. Some of them may be, um, may be uh, granular on specific issues that are very much localized on, on invasive species, or really technical issues in invasive species. But I really anticipate that a lot of them will have sort of a uh, cross-cutting um, cross-boundary aspect to them. In our workshop in Lake Tahoe, one of the most interesting discussions I thought was just on the interaction between wildfire and invasive species and in vegetation management. And that, that really touches basically every community in the West and basically every form of land management in the West. And so when we start thinking about recommendations, even in the, in the developing them in the stage mid-initiative, it's very um, useful to have this roundtable so we can look at how we, we will be able to revisit them occasionally, sort of set up these um, okay, uh, markers and check-ins for um, the implementation of those and, and look at them from a broader regional landscape perspective through the roundtable. So I think that actually having this will, will in some way impact the way that we formulate our recommendations and there are plans to implement them. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, we have another question here. Um, how uh, how can um, WGA's partners participate in the roundtable? Um, will there be a formal advisory group um, or working group? Um, so so my uh, initial thoughts on that. So so obviously one of the most immediate ways to participate. Uh, and this roundtable effort will be to engage at the upcoming um, October meeting in Cheyenne. But beyond that, uh, in, in a more general sense, you know, I, I referenced that we will be um, kind of launching a home for this on the WGA website. Um, I think that will be a way to stay up to speed with, with the activities going on here. Um, I think either emailing uh, myself, uh, Zach, Bill, or Troy and, and making sure that um, you're brought in on a, a distribution list for, for any roundtable activities would be another way um, that folks can engage. Um, and generally, I think, you know, I, 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 we're hoping that we, we are able to maintain kind of a core group of stakeholders that we've built out through all of these previous initiatives. Um, but leverage that in, into expanding that coalition even further and even broader um, as, as our work under the round table continues to evolve. Um, and it, it, to address the formal advisory group or working group, um, you know, I, I, I think that as I referenced in relation to the October meeting, there will be specific sessions that 
uh, may tie back more closely to previous WGA chair initiatives. So um, there will probably be work sessions that, that are tacked on to these roundtable events that will focus more on forest and range management. Some may focus more on invasive species. Some uh, may, may focus more on uh, species conservation and ESA. So it, that, that's, still a way, that's still a mechanism for folks to engage in these deep dive policy conversations on these very um, um, issue specific focuses while also um, being able to participate in the broader uh, efforts going on at these meetings. Um, I think also, you know, folks that, that remain engaged in these initiatives and ongoing, um, we, we do envision that uh, there is probably some role to play for um, kind of some ad hoc working groups that, that can work through um, refining governor's policy recommendations where necessary or if, if there's a specific outcome um, or, or recommendation that emerges from a, a roundtable effort, um, there may be some specific more nuanced consideration of how that, uh, that recommendation or outcome influences um, specific issues like forest and range management, species conservation. So I think there, there will still be a role for these, these more targeted discussions on um, the, the um, specific chair initiative focuses while also hoping to bring in folks for these larger roundtable discussions as well. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers that question. Um, Troy or Bill, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, the, I think it's something of an open question uh, what this will look like. And so for those of you that have been involved in uh, past WGA initiative work, I think we'd love to hear what you all think of how this is going. I think from a from a, from a WGA standpoint, our initiative, how we roll our initiatives is, is pretty solid. It's, I think we do a, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we do a good job with stakeholder engagement, uh, bringing in a wide variety of viewpoints to discuss um, the issues that we've got uh, teed up and, and are examining during our initiatives. But, as we move to a, this more where it's a, a broader, um, definitely a broader set of issues, I think we want to and plan to still use that same kind of, of really hardcore stakeholder involvement uh, and process um, to look for bipartisan solutions. But boy, if, you, if especially the folks that have been engaged with us in the past, if you've got ideas on, you know, what we're doing right and things we could improve, uh, I'm definitely open to, uh, to hearing that. Great. Thanks, Troy. Um, I think probably I have, have one final question here and then we will wrap things up. Um, so, so this question I, I think also segues pretty well from from that discussion, uh, and, and the question is, will WGA initiatives ever officially conclude, um, or will they live on the roundtable format uh, in perpetuity? Um, when do you declare uh, mission accomplished on an initiative? And that, I, I, I think, again, goes back to the recognition that uh, this roundtable was initially built out to help us um, serve governors better and help think through these issues in more of a way that a governor would in terms of looking at across the, the, the landscape and at, at looking at all of the different impacts that result from any given decision or threat. So I think as long as the governors continue to tell us through um, adopting policy resolutions or recommendations, as long as they continue to tell us that they care about Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act, Forest and Range Management, Invasive Species, Water Resources, et cetera, um, then that will be, you know, then those elements that made up those chair initiatives will continue to live on through this roundtable discussion. Um, so I think I think that's that's our um, that's our thinking on on how you know how these chairmen's initiatives will continue to live on under under this effort. Um, any thoughts beyond that? Yes. There, it's always, um, as we were putting together the, the National 
Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative and looking back at the history of WGA um, initiatives, I, we that's not the first time that, that WGA has focused on uh, forest management issues. And so a lot of these, uh, a lot of the things we look at are cyclical in nature and emerge as important issues and then fade and then come back. So uh, that's another thing I think this might uh, allow uh, us to do is, is you know, keep a, keep something of an eye on these issues as, as they uh, fade from the urgent and but remain important issues over the long term. Thanks, Troy. And and I, I think that really just gets to um, kind of going going back to the intent of the question is. Um, questions over what happens with WGA Chairman's initiatives as, after that first year. Um, I think we view this this platform as a way to ensure uh, durability and, and build out this, this long-term platform to make sure that the, the findings and the recommendations from those uh, Chairman's initiatives remain uh, in, in focus and remain a priority for WGA um, so long as as governors continue to to promote that policy as well. Um, we actually do have one more question. I think we, we have a bit of time. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll probably read this one and then wrap up. Um, so the, um, um, the, the question is, earlier discussions are helpful in building recommendations. Um, so the next step, is implementation. Uh, do you see WGA serving a role in facilitating stakeholder commitments for specific actions of implementation? Um, so I, I, I think, Troy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, it, well, I think the answer is yeah, absolutely. That's and that's if you look at what we've done on the national forest and range management <coughs> recommendations, that's probably that's one of the places we've been really successful in terms of, of trying to push uh, ahead with getting those recommendations implemented. We were lucky because a lot of those recommendations that came out of uh, the Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative were were very bipartisan, and uh, we had worked really hard to develop a lot of of uh, cohesion between federal agencies, uh, states, and states, and working with Congress all on how to get what's important, what do we need to get done. Fire borrowing fix is a is an excellent example of a really high priority um, effort that that needed to be addressed and that uh, fortunately we got enacted uh, as part of the FY18 Consolidated Appropriations Act. The the other element there is um, what can we do within our footprint, within the western states, uh, and focusing on those uh, actions that we can take and the states can take um, on their own to accomplish uh, good stuff. And there's plenty of those recommendations in the uh, Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative, and uh, you know that's a that's a thing where we're not. When the governors made those recommendations, it wasn't a every state should be doing X, Y, and Z. Is but what we had hoped to accomplish, and I think what the governors expected was that their people would 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 say, you know, X, Y, and Z are working in in different places and part of what you do um, from a from a land management standpoint ought to be examining 
what different states have done in these different areas and figuring out if it would work for you for you in your state. Um, the other element, and maybe it's not directly related, but when we look at things like uh, uh, Sage Grouse and the Sage Grouse Task Force, that's another thing. It's not all 19 states. It's 11 of our western states, but um, where WGA has been able to facilitate uh, the engagement of those 11 states and, and do some really positive things in terms of coordinating that regional response to a, a habitat uh, management need that existed. And I think WDA will, will continue to, to be involved um, as the governors want us to on efforts like that. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. I, I think it does. I mean, I think that um, WGA is at its best when we we um, are clearly bringing together folks and facilitating discussions on these tough issues um, that that take sort of a um, maybe a regional effort to truly address. Um, so. I think that that stands just as true with um, with policy development and, and and thought there as it does with implementation. Um, so I think I think that would be that would be my response to that. Um, Bill, do you have any any last thoughts you want to add to that? Or yeah, I, I just um, looking forward to the biosecurity invasive species initiative for that reason. It's sort of building off that model and that. Um, success that we learned from the National Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative. And I think, um, you know, if you look at the things that uh, it's likely that we're going to do, such as um, the, invasive bio, the Invasive Species Mobilization Campaign that we uh, referenced in the kickoff webinar for the initiative, um, that the implementation of that is not possible without um, our network of stakeholders and our advisory group and the, the folks within the region um, who are interested and um, very actively engaged in what WGA is doing. And so I think, you know, it's, it's the governors providing the leadership and the direction on an initiative like that and really the implementation, um, uh, being dependent upon the implementation for and, and the goodwill of the stakeholders involved in that. So I think that's an example of um, sort of a governor driven but just more region, uh, regionally implemented, the stakeholder implemented program that WGA uh, will be uh, will be um, leading, and I anticipate, I hope that there'll be more things like that coming out of the um, invasive biosecurity invasive species initiative. Great, thanks, Bill. Well, I I think um, I think that about does it. Looking at we're right running up on an hour now, so I want to be. Um, respectful of everyone's time. Um, really appreciate everyone who, who hopped on the webinar today um, and appreciate all of the questions. Um, we, we really sincerely look forward to engaging with all of you in this effort um, and continuing to build out what I think has been a very successful body of work uh, that, that has started from each of these unique uh, Governor's Chairman's initiatives. So. Um, this webinar, uh, for folks that may not have been able to attend, if you want to send this to a colleague, um, we do, this, this webinar has been recorded. Uh, we, we will be posting it on our website and can circulate some follow-up information there. Um, I'll also circulate some information on where to find all of the uh, Working Lands Roundtable activities going on on the WGA website. Um, so keep an eye out for that, um, and we will be in touch shortly. Thank you all again.